I'm a um, maritime archaeologist at Historic England. I work in our listing group, and my principal responsibility is to advise through colleagues and to DCMS on protection for maritime heritage assets offshore. And we'll look at the terminology of inshore and offshore. Um, I also run a large maritime archaeological program that looks at a range of historic assets offshore as well, in inshore waters as well, and sometimes we get involved with our colleagues for inland waterways as well. But at the back of my mind, whenever we commission some piece of work, we always, and I find myself asking, what's the point? You know, what, what's the point of doing this maritime archaeological work that's often hidden and underwater? So thank you very much. Please, if you have any ideas, let me know. And so um, I'm a ukulele novice, and I did think about uh, introducing my talk with the chords from uh, Country Roads, but uh, I'm not that good, and I can't quite get the chord changes for this verse, including Stranger to Blue Water. But the, the point of calling my talk Stranger to Blue Water is, I suppose, some of the mystery involved in maritime archaeology. It doesn't have a very large high profile, really, I think, within the sector, despite some of my colleagues' best efforts to try to change that. And we'll look at how we've moved forward um, in, in some areas. But what I wanted to do was to kind of demystify what maritime archaeology is at English, uh, uh, in English waters and at Historic England, and so help try to move towards some of the social and economic, or economic benefits of doing what we do. So the green area that you can see is really the statutory area of responsibility for Historic England, including England's inshore waters. And inshore waters is that green area that you can see off the coast, extending to about 12 nautical miles offshore. In some areas where we abut France, it's obviously slightly smaller. But then the blue area is defined under the 1969 Continental Shelf Act and is inc increasingly called, in marine planning terms, England's offshore area. And of course, maritime archaeology, by its very nature, the transitory nature of ships and boats and indeed aircraft, you know, don't respect these international boundaries, you know, including our boundaries with, with colleagues in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. So we work very closely with our offshore and underwater colleagues in marine management organisations as well as Department of Environment in Northern Ireland. So really our, our role in the green area that, that you can see is statutory. The ancient monument legislation that we're familiar with extends into that inshore area. But in, Historic England also has an advisory role in the blue area where maritime archaeology is often defined in subsequent legislation as being foreign monuments, which is why Historic England has been, it's been able to get involved making commentary on things like HMS Victory that sits beyond England's territorial waters. But we have an opportunity through legislation to engage in providing specialist advice to government, whether that's DCMS, MOD or FCO. Now, the uh, image on the, on the right of the screen was commissioned under the Aggregates Levy Sustainability Fund, if you can rem remember that, some time ago now. Southampton University was commissioned with public money to develop our changing nature of our understanding of the inundation of, uh, of the Southern North Sea Basin. I'll, I'll, I'll just skip back a sec and run that again for you. And what this short video is able, has enabled us to do is begin to reappraise our understanding of the inundation of the uh, northwest Europe to start enabling climate modelling and topo topographic modelling to begin to increase our idea of where human habitation would have been in that offshore area. And so really, from the end of the glacial period, the, the emphasis and movement of maritime archaeology shifts from our understanding of the prehistoric past back to the transitory nature of uh, ships, aircraft, and of course vehicles that would have supported the Normandy invasion and so on. So really, you know, maritime archaeology is kind of hinged between those interested in prehistory offshore and those interested in ships and boats and aircraft, you know, that hinges around the inundation of, of, the, uh, of the landscape. But there's an awful lot of stuff out there. This, this chart from the um, UK Hydrographic Office through the Marine Management Organisation is a, data, is a course data map of known sites, which, which are the red ones, which the uh, Hydrographic Office, who are the, um, the chart makers for the Royal Navy, you know, are interested in identifying seabed features, principally to avoid submarines bumping into things <coughs> offshore. And the blue, the blue dots that you can see are unrecorded features. So these things like fishermen's fasteners, where fishermen have reported snagging their nets or something large underwater, that may be a rock outcrop, it may, may be um, elements of prehistory, or, or indeed it may be an uncharted wreck site. So the importance of this data really allows us um, some measure of control and understanding when we're commenting 
on, as, as we'll see, offshore wind farm development, cables coming ashore, and so on. So it allows us, you know, really to have a broad-based understanding of what might be there and what might be impacted from seabed development. And this is a composite chart of uh, northwest England. You can see um, the, uh, the entrance to the Morecambe and Fleetwood in there, uh, superimposed on the Ordnance Survey. But the offshore stuff, really, the black lines are the, the, uh, the bathymetry, so really the, uh, the inverse of the Ordnance Survey, um, landscape topography. So that's taking the bathymetry and our understanding of topography offshore through these contour lines. The, uh, the diamonds and the dots, uh, this is the, uh, the offshore wind farm, and they're, they're the remains of the turbines that, that are there. We can see cables coming ashore. We can see the lights into the river entrance here, and the navigational markers, and individual wreck sites. So it's really, really busy in the marine environments. You know, we, we go to the coast, we have our stick of rock and ice cream, and look over um, a flat, flat grey wobbly mass. But there's an awful lot of stuff that's marked on the seabed, you know, largely to assist mariners in safe navigation. But of course, all these things represent elements of our past. You know, these, these are a collection of wreck sites in the entrance um, to the approaches into Morecambe. You know, so we can use this data to inform marine planning. So with all that mass of stuff, let's just go back a little bit. You know, with all of that mass of stuff, how then do we determine really what's important? You know, it, it, take, it will take a, a lifelong piece of work to start looking at all of the, um, the military wreck sites from the First World War and Second World War to start understanding which of those are important. And we'll look at how we're beginning to manage iron and steel shipwrecks shortly, conscious of time. So um, 2011, uh, UK governments uh, came together to produce the Marine Policy Statement. This sits alongside the um, terrestrial planning policy, which is quite an interesting in itself because terrestrial planning policy extends down to mean low water whereas UK marine policy extends from high water outwards. So this coastal strip you know, is applicable to both terrestrial planning and marine planning. And the, the marine policy statement has a specific section in there related to heritage and indicates that, that underwater archaeological sites must be managed according to their significance. So really that's our first cut into, into marine planning when... when uh, new sites come to, come to us to try to determine exactly what it is that's significant and some assets may have more, more significant elements than others and of course perhaps at the bow of a um, of a warship may be more significant than its stern we can perhaps discuss that a little later on and then within that we have the corporate program that you'll be aware of the heritage at risk and we'll look at shortly one of the protected wreck sites that's a really flagship if you excuse the pun of our heritage at risk project to try to reduce the risks to these assets through our big corporate program. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with um, ex expanding and extending ancient monument legislation offshore, this, this chart really hopefully <coughs> says it all. So this is this taken as the high water mark, which is the, the, uh, the terrestrial extent of marine planning, if you remember, and the low water mark is the seaward extent of terrestrial planning. So above high water, we can apply um, listed building designation, as you know, and of course, scheduled ancient monument designations. In the intertidal zone, the Protection of Wrecks Act can, can start and can kick in, as well as scheduling and listing applies down to mean low water. And then following further out offshore to the 12 nautical mile limit, you remember the green area in that previous slide, ancient monument legislation can carry on through to the limit of territorial waters. So uh, one of our recent successes in collaborative working which has really begun to tell and indicate uh, social and economic uh, successes really for local areas. Is this the London shipwreck site located in the Thames estuary? You might be familiar with it. it, it it's been on uh, some of the news feeds and Twitter and so on. It's a warship, it's a Cromwellian warship that blew up in 1665 on its way out to the Second Dutch War, discovered actually during mitigation for the uh, London Gateway, uh, the London Gateway Port of London, which wished to develop a slightly deeper approach dredge uh, into the Thames estuary, and this London shipwreck site just sat on the, on the uh, upper works of the new dredge channel, and so as it, it was exposed, as material was beginning to erode down into the newly dredged channel. So it's all the fittings that, that you can imagine of a, of a late 17th century warship, including this 17th century cannon truck recovered last year. So the work happening um, last summer and finishing this summer is really an evaluation to allow us to understand the depth of deposit of the wooden hull so that in future years we can be then to begin to determine you know, just how much excavation may cost. One of the challenges, of course, of this type of work, as you know, is the conservation 
of this material, but we've been very fortunate in that South End Museum Service has committed themselves to a brand new museum and visitors centre in the South End area where this material is going to end up. So, of course, we then start beginning to, to be concerned about the recovery of all of this material, ensuring its conservation and its curation as subsequent public display. Uh, you may know that the volunteer team that we'll talk about in a moment uh, was, uh, won the, the Marsh Community Volunteer Award at the CBA earlier this year. And the professional partnerships that I mentioned is public sector funding from Historic England direct to, in this instance, Cotswold Archaeology, who are managing the diving programme with the volunteers. Now, because the London is a protected wreck site, it means that access to protected wrecks in English, uh, Welsh and Northern Irish waters... Uh, to maybe I'll, I'll take that Scotland in a moment. Access to these protected wreck sites is by a licensing scheme subject to the administration and authorisation of the Secretary of State. So people wishing to go and visit these sites have to, get a, have to apply, to, in this case, to Historic England to apply for a licence to access. Otherwise, it would be a criminal offence to go and visit without, without this so-called licence. So the, the individuals and their groups that wish to go and access these, the volunteers, that become, become called licensees because they hold the licence. Mm-hmm. Now, it just so happened that the licensee of the London is a diver in the Thames estuary, is also a fishmonger, and became interested in the work that, that we were doing as mitigation prior to the development of the protected wreck site in there. And so he's really taken on the activity as part of this work. So Historic England funded him to t- undertake some slightly more challenging um, uh, recreational diving qualifications to allow him to dive with a specialist team that Cotswold provides. So we're enabling development of locally based expertise through professional diving qualifications. The, the recreational divers here, fishmongers by trade, can engage with professional archaeologists working underwater in, as you know, a very incredibly challenging environment. So we're setting up really a community programme in the Thames estuary with South End Borough Council, who are indeed are putting money into the project as part of initial surveys for earlier this year, to allow really, um, I suppose, local administration of the work. The site will remain at risk. It's a very high risk site, as you can imagine, in the Thames estuary. A lot of wet timber exposed. So then Historic England can begin to back off, knowing that the work will continue, and we can then begin to direct our resources, our finite resources, as Hugh has already mentioned, to other sites that are at high risk. Another story related to the London is uh, the heritage crime. This chap, Vince Walsgrove, is currently serving two years in prison and his um, a four offence of in excess of uh, £46,000 for the theft of five bronze cannons from the London prior to its designation as a protected wreck site. The fraud offence was non-reporting of the recovered material. So these incredibly important early bronze cannons, some of which were captured from the Dutch, or stolen from the Dutch, some might say, in the first Dutch war, and then re-put onto the, our, sorry, our European partners, put, into the, um, put onto the London subsequently. From, from being captured and now in America uh, Vince as you can imagine made an awful lot of money from their sale so part of our work in our statutory responsibility is to provide these heritage crime impact statements to the enforcement agencies which really allows the uh, development and understanding of the effects of the unlawful recovery of these cannons on the, on the archaeology underwater this gun that Vince is sitting astride sat, would have originally been on that gun carriage the carriage was broken during the recovery of this cannon and we've been able to academically put that cannon back onto that carriage the carriage is going to, get, going to go on display in South End Museum it's currently in York under, undergoing conservation um, and South End Museum service have got the money together to repatriate these cannon so eventually in 2017-18 the cannons will be on display for the local people to see we're working with South End Borough Council to have um, kind of computer based terminal at the end of South End Pier that happens to overlook the site so local residents can get involved in you know, touch screen and, and recreate the shipwreck site and Birmingham University are developing you know, some kind of programme to really raise the London raise the London up digitally uh, another collaborative project has been the, um, the designation or, or designation advice for the first, this First World War U-boat U-8, and that happens to be the earliest First World War U-boat in English waters and was the first one lost in English waters during the First World War. Uh, During the First World War, then, uh, the um, the Royal Navy netted off the entrance to the English Channel. And the reason they did this was to stop the U-boat fleet from exiting through the Channel into the the, uh, Eastern uh, Eastern Atlantic. So it would have used far more fuel to head north 
U8 tried to slip those nets and save itself fuel and time by getting out to attack shipping in the um, uh, Atlantic, but found itself on this net barrage, which was a combination of uh, chain link nets uh, attached to mines. And the X mark here on the end of this sandbank is where the U8 triggered a mine and surfaced. The crew were taken off by the Destor destroyer patrol, called in the First World War, the Dover Patrol. The Dover Patrol, as it sounds, was to navigate between England and France to ensure that the shipping lanes stayed open for the troops and uh, to go backwards and forwards. But also was, was present when this U-boat came to the surface. The crew were taken off and the U-boat was scuttled. So um, I suppose historically it's a relatively easy target to designate because it's, does, it doesn't have a status as a war grave because no submariners were lost on it. So our approach then was really the interest in the hull. Is the hull historically significant or not? And if so, does it meet the threshold for designation? And then is designation warranted in this instance? But because of its location in the middle of the English Channel, which as you know is the busiest shipping lane in the world, the uh, Maritime and Coast Guard Agency didn't want us to have divers in the water on this occasion. Um, for obvious various navigational reasons if, if there had been a big fog bank for example it could have been pretty hazardous to the divers in the water for having a, a stationary boat anchored so we took a new approach, a novel approach of an AUV, autonomous underwater vehicle and here it is you can see being launched by its vessel and it's towing a magnetometer which is uh, uh, an underwater metal detector to all intents and purposes so the AUV is, is gathering multi-beam bathymetry so um, an acoustic image, a digital acoustic image that can be manipulated three-dimensionally and given false colour, and a side scan image, which is uh, another acoustic type of images, image that takes a, um, a horizontal uh, sweep, a horizontal acoustic sweep of the seabed. So we're looking here at an acoustic uh, shadow of the submarine that's sitting, as you can see, upright on the seabed. So here's the submarine here. It's curved because of the, uh, the, because of the curve of the boat because of the AUV around it. So the hull's not bent, it's the curve of the equipment. And then you can make out the conning tower, uh, the, the big um, blunt bow, and the stern of the submarine. And the white space is the acoustic shadow. So again, we're, we, you know, we're using public money to develop uh, innovative technologies. In this case, uh, Wessex Archaeology were commissioned to undertake this survey. And then we're furthering our knowledge through the use of AUVs. We, we're giving um, professional archaeologists the opportunity to experiment with AUVs as an archaeological service, which was the first time this had been done in English waters. Uh, at the same time, um, we're trying to understand how to manage First and Second World War remains underwater. You know, so we, we've got a handle. We've, we recognise, I think, that we can understand how to manage shipwreck archaeology underwater from wooden assets, from wooden sites. What we're not too sure of, what I'm not too sure of, is how we can continue to manage the decay and degradation of First and Second World War metal underwater. So part of the same process, the programme, was to undertake underwater thickness testing, or uh, UDT, and non-destructive testing, using uh, a Cygnus dive gauge, which is a piece of equipment used in the <coughs> offshore oil industry, really to measure the uh, stability and deterioration decay of the spud legs of, of some of the big offshore piers. And of course, it's in the uh, offshore manager's interest to, to find out the integrity of those offshore pier legs to their to their big towers and so this works on an echo pulse system much like um, uh, ultrasound used, used in pregnancy so it, it being, pings a, an acoustic pulse into a piece of metal and it times its, times its reflection and so from that we can gauge thickness so the point of doing this work was to really determine just how thick the hull of the submarines are against their built specification so worryingly or interestingly uh, for a submarine that sank in 1912, the Holland 5, its specification was built at 12, 12 and a half millimetres. Now, you know, the pinch, pinch of salt here and the rule of thumb is that we're assuming then that the submarine, when it sank, was built to specification. You know, you know we've got no alternative. So the submarine sank, and when it, when it sank, it was built to 12 and a half millimetres. Uh, having been on the seabed for just over 100 years, we can see the decay in, in this area. So this is uh, seaweed adhering to the steel hull. It's been cleaned back to uh, a corrosive layer over the steel. We then um, hit a, a small hull in the corroded layer down to clean steel where we measure it because we can't use that equipment on the corroded layer because we get a lot of acoustic reflections. 
So you can see you know, quite a substantial loss in steel over that 100 year period. And then the hole is backfilled with uh, uh, underwater epoxy resin that's mixed up by the divers and then plugged, plugged back into place. So all of that then generated an awful lot of interest. We were on, on the telly, um, five metres worth of people watched it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so you can see here that, that overnight, you know, nearly, nearly seven million or so people you know, got, got an interest and got to see the results of this U-boat work. It was in the Telegraph and online and print in the Telegraph. You know, that generated about two and a half or so million people. So you know, a real success in getting maritime archaeology for a re relatively cheap project um, for, for, for what we were able to achieve, you know, into the front room, onto the tablets of seven and a half million people, which can't really be bad. Running again alongside that then is a relatively new program for us to begin to understand the effects of oceanic climate change. Because as a sector and, and an oceanic profession, we really don't know the effects of oceanic climate change, particularly um, uh, increased ocean acidity on on metal shipwrecks underwater because of course we know that the ocean is becoming more acidic and you can see here uh, seawater is in the range of 7.5 to uh, about 8.4 um, nobody has yet taken any data at bed level a lot of oceanographic data for climate change is taken on the sea surface so we're beginning a program to understand uh, really the o oceanographic pH at bed level in and around wreck sites so that we can be able to manage change and feed that back into the national programme for understanding oceanographic climate change. Really relatively early days and of course a big long-term project and the danger really, I suppose the challenge is that a more acidic ocean will increase decay on metal shipwreck sites underwater. So this next slide then, so please limit your uh, observations to Twitter only. Earlier last month, we worked with the University of Southampton to undertake some acoustic prospection of a, uh, of a medieval shipwreck site believed to be in the River Hamble, perhaps related to Henry V, the wreck of the Holy Ghost. Uh, early indications are, are pretty, pretty good. There, there is a, a boat hull shape down there, and these, these guys pushing this piece of acoustic equipment developed for the offshore oil and gas sector takes a block of sound, it takes a cube of sound from below bed level in this challenging, you know, relatively benign but challengingly deep river environment. And the data will be a report back to us to determine future mitigation. But these guys are using the results also to further their PhDs in marine prospection underwater. So combining maritime archaeological investigation with cutting edge offshore oil and gas industry to allow development of a PhD. And for those individuals that can't dive and can't get access to England's underwater estate, really, if you, if you like to call it that, or underwater heritage assets, we're developing these so-called virtual dive trails. This is the, uh, there's nothing to, there's no manipulation yet, I'm afraid. Uh, this is the remains of HMS Colossus, a Nelsonian warship that bumped into the Isles of Scilly in about 1798 and fell over. And you can see here bronze guns uh, sticking up, but out through the, through the portholes. So we're looking at the internal side of the Colossus here. You can obviously see this, the bow and the stern here. A really good diver trail. And, and the boys, the yellow boys, is an underwater trail that visiting divers can go down and take a slate and navigate themselves underwater and see these spectacular bronze guns and a lovely clean sandy seabed in the Isles of Scilly. But then you know, some people can't dive and, and go and see this stuff. So we've, we're developing on several shipwreck sites these inter interactive virtual trails that will be hosted obviously online to allow people to manipulate them <coughs> and, and take a tour you know, of, of this stuff that I find really interesting. So allowing you know, further public access to this largely hidden and, and strange underwater environment. Uh, trying to bring some of these things together then is a recent, is a, is a recent piece of work undertaken by the Europe, European Commission called the Blue, Blue Growth Project. And what this is trying to do, this is to try to, to maximise um, elements of, of what they're calling the blue economy. So, so how jobs, recreation and uh, infrastructure supports development and economic sustainability in the offshore area. And some work by Firth recently identified in the offshore area. We can start talking about 
three different levels of engagement for socio-economic benefits. So there's people, I suppose, involved in it, whether, whether they're contractors, PhD students, or, or, or employees involved in maritime archaeology, p- people that b- might belong to the Nautical Archaeology Society, for example, or, or, pe- or um, you know, these volunteers that I spoke about, Steve Ellis, the fishmonger, if you remember, those kind of people gave in volunteers, you know, two and a half thousand hours given to England's protected wreck sites alone in their work that they've undertaken. Just under 10% of the Historic England's um, commission's budget was dispersed on maritime archaeological projects last year, supporting development of the sector, as you can see. We had about 4,000 visiting divers to the protected wreck estate last year, and those numbers increase year on year as we're able to talk about it and promote them. And for people such as those that live in South End on Sea, for example, those inhabitants who get the real interest from being close to these historic assets, you know, South End on Sea Borough Council wouldn't be investing in the protected record of London, for example, if they couldn't then generate the social capital, footfall in the, in the museum, and visitor attractions, and so on, that, that, that these protected wreck sites have. And then, really, um, just short. Looking to looking to the future in the white paper, there was a small element of maritime archaeology in there. There's been pressure from government by lobby groups to try to allow government to review its position on the 2001 Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage. And in the white paper, you can see government made a commitment to review that position. There will obviously be a continued need for maritime archaeological capabilities to manage these protected wreck sites to further research. And of course, that Heritage at Risk programme, as I mentioned right at the beginning, to take those red sites, those flag sites that, that we know are at risk, to move them down into the yellow, amber, maybe at risk, and, and to really to try to get them off of the register. So follow us through uh, HE Maritime if, if you're interested. And like I say, if you've got any ideas about what's the point of all this, then please let me know. Thank you. <laughs>